what I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the same. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. Today is no different. I have Len Bland of Nano Gas Environmental. And before I formally introduce Len, Len, I always like to mention other episodes people should check out in the podcast. Since we're talking about innovative technologies that can help the world, um, I had Moïse Navone of Mobileye, and he talks about his journey to being acquired by Intel for $15.3 billion and helping fuel the autonomous vehicle journey. Also had Dan Kurzrock, a co-founder of Regrain. And Regrain take, it has technology that basically transforms beer waste, the spent grain, into food and granola bars. So uh, they they call it edible upcycling. And you know, I was talking with Avril Tomlin Hood, who runs BOA, uh, they do um, paid marketing for brands that care about people on the planet. And we were having this very conversation, like who are some of the brands and companies that are just doing amazing things by doing good also. And some, you know, some of her favorite companies are like Beyond Meat and some of the, uh, those plant-based companies. So check out those and others on inspiredinsider.com. Uh, this episode is brought to you by Rise 25 and at Rise 25. We help businesses give to and connect their dream 100 relationships and how do we do that? We help you run your podcast. We're an easy button for helping you launch and run your podcast. You know, for me, Len, the number one thing in my life is relationships. I'm always looking at ways to give to my best relationships. And I found no better way to do that than the profile of people and companies I most admire on this planet and profile them and share with everyone else what they're working on. So if you thought about podcasting, you should. If you have questions, just go to rise25.com and we're happy to answer them. I want to do give a big thank you and shout out to Jay Rovert, who has uh, been a financial advisor for 40 years, who runs a high-level networking group. And I met Timothy Garibrand, who then introduced me to Len. So thank you, Tim, for introducing us. I know he works with Millimatch. Um, so check out Millimatch. It's a science and of risk mitigation by matching culture to, uh, to potential. So um, I want to introduce Len. As you have such an impressive background, you know, doing research about you. Um, Len Bland co-founded uh, Patrick Corp, uh, which now has 2,000 employees, uh, and he's helped entrepreneurs raise millions as the owner of Concept Equity Group and has served as VP of sales for a Silicon Valley software vendor and is the CEO of Nanogas. And he's introduced, uh, he was introduced to the world-changing technology behind Nano gas environmental, so he had to be a part of it. And um, he's going to explain it better than me. But nano gas environmental cleans and energizes water with tiny bubbles, and it's one of the best solutions for actually treating dirty water. He's going to talk about some of the application and and some of the amazing stuff they're doing to help clean up the planet, essentially. So, Len, thanks for joining me. Well, Jeremy, thank you for having me on your podcast. Really excited about it. Um, and. One thing I want to start with is how did you even get into this field of nano gas environmental? Well, you know, 17 years ago, I started working with my first entrepreneur. And I learned that I love providing insight that leads to entrepreneurial growth. So I started preparing entrepreneurs for investment and helping them raise millions. And then when I was introduced to this technology, the kind of, uh, I, it, it just was so world changing and affected so many different things. I knew I had to be part of it. So we tracked down the intellectual property and we created the company. How did you discover it? Well, uh, just like all the other companies that come to us, uh, early stage companies looking to raise capital. One of the companies came to us, they were looking to raise capital. They described what they were doing. It sounded really exciting. Uh, we went to see them. The, we thought maybe we'll market for them. The the meeting went great. On the way home, they said their in, their technology came out of Wayne State University. I called somebody I know there at the incubator, and they said, "Hold on, these people don't own the technology." So that was the beginning of our journey. You get a lot of pitches, and you probably talk to a lot of entrepreneurs. What stuck out with this one? 
uh, as soon as as soon as we looked at it, we saw that this was brand new science that affected we and we developed three pages of multi-billion dollar markets that we could go after with the technology was so uh, so interesting and, and affected so many things that we just uh, we couldn't put it down. I would love to hear what you look for in in investment. Right. It looks like one of those things is the size of the market. What do you what are you thinking when you get a pitch or you're trying to help someone, uh, you know, they're raising money? Well, we run a, a monthly group and we ask the entrepreneurs to answer six questions. What's the product? Why will the customer buy it? What's amazing about the management team? And I'll tell you, a lot of investors, that's the number one thing they look at is what's amazing about the management team. How does the company make money? What kind of traction does the company have? And we want to see that traction. And how does the investor make money? So it needs to have a certain amount that the investor needs to be able to make based on projections. It needs to be uh, something that looks like there's a, a competitive standout and, and something that uh, has an amazing management team. Have you had cases where they didn't have their monetization strategy figured out like that, how they make money part well, wasn't nine, figured 90, out? Yeah. 95% um, of the time when the entrepreneurs approach us, they don't tell us how the investor is going to make money. They don't know. A lot of times they don't know. Sometimes they didn't put it in their deck and didn't tell us, but most of the times they don't know. And we have to coach them through that process so they can get it across simply to investors. So we're not trying to get into the details here. This is just like, hey, am I going to make money doing this if it comes out the way you think it's going to come out? That's an important question to answer for the investor, right? Yeah, well, I would think so. I mean, when you go to the store, you kind of want to know how much things cost and, and what it's going to do for you. And this is, for investors, this is what it's going to do for them. So speaking of nanogas, and people could check this out at nanogasenvironmental.com. And but um I would love for you to talk about how it works. And I know one of those things you go into existing wells, but um, and you have some visuals that can kind of, you know, I think it's a, a good image, <laughs> some good imagery with what you do. So if you want to share your screen and share, share that and go into what you actually do when you are going, you know, when you go into existing wells. Yeah. So we we uh, we go after three huge markets. We've proven all of these commercially. We deliver a lot of value for the customers. We gain a lot of value for ourselves, and we have a, a competitive advantage, like I was talking about. That's uh, cleaning up sewage lagoons, cleaning up oil industry wastewater. And getting more oil out of existing wells without having to do more drilling or fracking or using chemicals. Uh, uh, on the uh, on the sewage lagoon side, we uh, we were working with. Uh, do you want me to start with the wells or, or just? No, uh, go ahead. Yeah, okay. keep going in order. Yeah, we'll All get right. to the wells, but but yeah. Uh, on the sewage lagoon side, you know, we were out in New Home, Texas. They had a small community, three hundred homes. Uh, their lagoons to, to treat their sewage were sludge laden. They were algae covered. There were bugs walking on top of the algae. It was probably harmful. And they were told that in order to fix your lagoons and clean them up, it's going to cost you a million dollars to dredge out the lagoons. And so they're wondering, well, you know, I wonder if there's a different way. And, you know, they thought about things like bubbling gas through their water, bubbling, you know, air through. But the lagoons were so shallow that wasn't going to work. Uh, so what we did is we put in our, we provided our solution, which included our nanobubbles, nanogas nanobubbles. What's cool about nanobubbles is that we can create over 2 trillion bubbles per gallon. And they're so small, you can't even see them with a light-based microscope. But you can see them with a laser light. You can actually shine it through the water. When you shine a laser light through regular water, tap water, you don't see anything. But when you shine it through water with nanobubbles in it, it 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 
uh, bounces off the nanobubbles and you can see the laser line in the water. And so that's that's how you know there's nanobubbles in there. And the cool thing about these bubbles is, you know, imagine opening up your Coke and all the carbon dioxide starts coming out. Well, we could open up a Coke if it held our nanobubbles. You wouldn't see any bubbles coming out because the bubbles don't rise. Their buoyancy is less than the surface tension of the liquid, which means we could put in a whole lot more gas into, into a liquid, and that what, that's what makes it special. Is there an application yeah. in in that market? Like yeah. pop so, and carbonated beverages? Uh, well, uh, you know, a lot of people think it would be really cool to drink a beverage with more oxygen in it, for, for example. Uh, but our guts are anaerobic. They don't use oxygen. And so we're a little bit reluctant, even though there'd be nothing stopping us from going into that market. Yeah. Uh, so we'd want to do research and testing before we did that. Uh, but if it's being consumed, yeah, yeah. But on the lagoon side, we know that bacteria use that oxygen to survive. And the reason why you get these high buildups of algae and sludge is because there's no oxygen left and all the good bacteria have died off. And now you just have bad bacteria that produce methane and you have, uh, and you have uh, algae buildup. I just want to so point as as, out really quickly, yeah. Len, if someone's listening to the audio, um, there is a video component of this. And you're, what we're looking at right now are three images, kind of uh, sequent different days of kind of how it started. And then after the treatment, I guess you would call it. So, Yeah. So, going. you know, within one day of adding nanobubble oxygen, the algae started to disappear. Within four days, it was gone. Over time, we restored the entire lagoon because we got oxygen down at the bottom where the bacteria could get to the sludge that was uh, on the bottom. So we reduced the bacteria, ate up the organic sludge. Uh, they ate up 95% of it. And that restored the lagoon and gave them space to operate for years and saved them over $900,000. When I'm looking at this, um, you know, because one of the questions I'm thinking of, how do you administer it? It looks like there's a long tube going out to something in the middle. How do you go out and administer the um, the nano bubbles? Yeah, we have hoses with nozzles on them that we can just uh, we can just put into the water, and those distribute uh, water with nano bubbles. The cool thing is that we can take dirty water, so we can pull in dirty water into our system add the nanobubbles, put it out again, and we don't clog up. So that's that makes us really different and makes us perfectly suited for these dirty water situations. So who found you and who hired you in this situation? Because I'm sure there's, there's places all over the United States and world that don't know this exists. Well, there right? are places all over the United States and the world. So beginning with, we had a relationship with Alpha Omega Resources. They're a distributor to small you know, communities and their wastewater treatment problems. We're looking at a picture of uh, uh, the owner of Alpha Omega Resources testing how much organic sludge there is in the pond. Uh, so our plan is to go out through distributors. But when we go out, for this market, uh, there's a group in every state called uh, a not-for-profit called the Rural Wastewater Association, and they have people that are called that are uh, circuit riders. They're called that go check on all the small communities and try and help them with their problems. And so that's the perfect group to for us to connect to in each state to uh, start to get our solution out in the United States. Yeah, so there's a lot of partners that will, you know, realize they have this technology, and it sounds like it's really economical compared to other solutions too. Like you said, I guess they got a quote for a million dollars, and it ended up costing a hundred thousand dollars. Right, less than a hundred thousand. Yeah. Now you asked about the oil industry, and there's really two things we focus on in the oil industry. A lot of people don't know this, but when they in the US, when we pump oil out of the ground, we're really pumping it out of underground water aquifers that contain 
you know, on average, the U.S. pumps out seven times more water than oil. Worldwide, we pump out, the oil industry pumps out 12.6 billion gallons of polluted water out of the ground. That's new water. And uh, in the U.S. is about a quarter of that. We have to do something with all this polluted water. The in some places around the world where their country doesn't have the same kind of rule of law, they just release that polluted water into the environment, which is really scary. In the US, what we do is we, the cheapest thing to do is to shove it back down into the ground where it didn't come from before. And the first thing we do is we go build a multi-million dollar saltwater disposal well uh, and we allow the oil and water to separate, and we treat it with chemicals, and then we put it down into the ground. The problem is that even when we put it down into the ground and treat it with chemicals, it still could be, you know, we might start with uh, water with some oil in it. You can see a picture of that on the left if you're looking at the pictures, and end up with black water that you think has, maybe has oil in it, but it's really just uh, got um corrosive iron sulfide that's going to increase the maintenance for that saltwater disposal well. So they're putting that back down into the ground. And the real problem is that can cause earthquakes. So in Oklahoma and Texas, they're seeing more and more earthquakes as a result of the oil industry disposing all the water into the ground. Texas just had a 5.4 magnitude earthquake. There was the largest scene there in quite some time. Uh, and uh, Oklahoma noticed this, and they started cutting back on the water they were disposing, and uh, the earth number of earthquakes went down. Yeah, so those lagoons and then the oil industry, um, what's next? So when we treat, uh, I'll just skip this for now, when we treat that water from the oil industry, instead of that uh, water that requires maintenance and chemicals in a multi-million dollar facility, we treat it so that it could be reused by the oil industry instead of fresh water. Wow. And so uh, that's our goal is to replace the need for using fresh water in the oil industry and then provide them water for our next step. So the previous picture, Lang, just go back to the previous picture. The previous picture is really the um, I guess the old method, a different method from yours. It's that's what's currently being used, and you can see both are dark. And then your method, actually, you can see is completely clear. Is that what we're looking yeah. at? Yeah, it's clear. Uh, it this a lot of times in the oil industry, this water is coming from underground. And it's usually salty like the oceans, only it's actually sometimes 10 times saltier than the oceans. So you can't take this water. It's very expensive to desalinate. It's more expensive than a desalination plant because those plants can't handle water with this much salt. That's why, I dispose, that's why they dispose of it now. But we think a better use is for the oil industry to reuse it. They could put it back into oil wells as long as the grit and solids are removed, the oil is removed and the iron sulfide is removed, and we do all those things. It's pretty remarkable. So then, uh, you know, we've got opportunities. We've got a um, uh, oil company in South America and a distributor, just like we have in the in the lagoons. We have worked through distributors. We have a distributor in South America who's lined us up with an oil company to do a paid pilot, and we're waiting for that. Uh, contract. And then we think that can lead to a 10 to $14 million contract for us per year uh, because they have maintenance problems with their oil wells. Great. Now, uh, eventually, uh, we can take that water and reuse it. And so we do, we actually make the water better uh, for recovering oil. That's called enhanced oil recovery. We're renting out a couple units to a PCT, which adds some, uh, just some salt water and electricity to make it even better. But compared to just salt water, uh, we recover oil with nanogas that you wouldn't normally recover. 
So you can, so we went down in an oil well and in the first five days, we did 30 days worth of production after adding our nanobubbles. And by the end of 60 days, we had doubled the production of the oil well. And right now we just finished up four wells in Kansas and we're really excited to see what those results are at Dixon Operating Company because, and they're excited too, because we think we're going to have the same kind of effect on their wells as well. So imagine being able to increase the oil production, potentially nearly every well in the world, without having to do any new drilling or fracking or using chemicals. As you expand, I don't know if there's any other, are there any other um, images? Yeah, keep going. Uh, yeah, I, I have mean, a question. I keep going. Yeah. But I, I thought I'd let you ask. Oh, I had a question, question about, you know, as you grow and expand, I imagine you need capital to do that and raising money. And when you're talking to potential investors, mm-hmm. What are some of the like biggest questions they have besides how it works, um, and you know how are you addressing that? I mean, this is kind of your thing in general is helping people raise money, right? So yeah, so what are the questions are six, you're getting? There are six really important questions that uh, we, when I work with entrepreneurs, we ask them to answer, and I'm careful to include that in my presentation as well. What's a product or service? Why will the customer buy it? What's amazing about the management team? What kind of traction does the company have? How does the company make money? And how does the investor make money? And so uh, those are really a focus area for us. Those are the investors want to know all that. They may want to know some other things like who's the competition, like uh, what's, uh, what's the market size. Uh, but we think those six questions are core. What type of companies are ideal to invest? So what type of companies uh, do we look for for uh, business, for concept equity group? Or what type of investors do we look for for nanogas? Investment? For nanogas. So we're looking for investors that care about sustainability, might know something about the oil industry, but that's not important but mostly for investors that really want to make a difference and see how they can make money and make a difference at the same time. One of the reasons why we love this, this uh, technology is because you can make money while doing good. How did the team come together? We're looking at a, you know image of you, the chief scientist, COO. Yeah. So, you know, I started with uh, people that I'd been working with before. Uh, you know, uh, Jeff Harden, for example, is a successful serial entrepreneur, and he was helping companies uh, fund companies because he'd been successful with his companies. His most, most notable one was he worked with the CDC and Dr. Salk in Bank of America to help get uh, AIDS patients who couldn't afford their medicine money by buying their life insurance policies so they could afford their medicine. And while Jeff ran that business, Jeff was in that business, they they earned 67% annual rate of return. And so he was a founder with me on Nanogas. Uh, and he was he helped me understand all the benefits of the technology. And then Dave Schimp, our chief operating officer, was a senior manager responsible for the largest bankruptcy in the history of the U.S. at one time, Wix. He, he, uh, he was a senior manager for McKinsey and advising them. And then he helped grow uh, one of the early DSL, the, the uh, communications companies called Rhythms, and he grew them from 200 employees to over 3,000. So Dave's a great operator, which fills a real need for us. And he came on board about a year, a year and a half ago. How do you, do you, when you work through um, these distributors and partners, are they helping implement? Um, like you looked at, you know, we saw that lagoon. Um, who's actually going in to administer the technology? So, you know, in the early stages, like we are, we're heavily involved. And, and really, we believe that 
this technology is so new, the market doesn't really understand it. And so you need to provide a solution, not a, a piece of hardware. We've seen people provide pieces of hardware and, and the project fails, the algae isn't cleaned up, whatever it is. Uh, but we know if you do the right work, if you understand what the wastewater is, how much needs to be cleaned up, if you do the right scientific work that Jeff Harden is really good at, uh, then you come up with the right pieces, not just ours, but other pieces. Maybe we need to provide the bacteria. Maybe we need to do DNA testing to determine uh, what kind of bacteria is in the pond already. Uh, when you provide the right pieces, maybe you need to bring a generator on site because they don't have electricity. Uh, then you provide a solution that works. And so that's how we approach what we're doing. But as we move and as we grow, we're partnering with distributors that are going to be able to do that analysis for us and uh, monitor our equipment in the field. Now, once that we're taking one step further, though, we're automating all our equipment. We're reporting back on it on all the data. We're going to use that for predictive maintenance to to know when we need to fix the equipment before it needs fixing. And then uh, eventually add an artificial intelligence layer that helps us get better and better at what we do. From the partner standpoint, um, talk about working with partners because um, obviously you've done this throughout your career and this is an amazing way to get distribution um, through what you're doing. Um, how do you approach the partner as, for, as far as the, the value proposition for them? I love working with partners and, you know, one of the really neat things is when we uh, we have such strong <clears throat> value propositions that if they're an industry expert, they're like, wow, you can do that. I need to take this to the market. So when we wanted to approach Dixon operating, we, uh, you know, our, our rep in for uh, Oklahoma, Don Cole said, wow, I've got 30 years plus in the oil industry and I know what this can do and I'm excited to take it out and I'm going to tell everybody about it. And so, you know, this is just this one oil company took us to. We're doing four wells now, but they have 800 wells that they, uh, once we show them how well it works, they'll turn it on for all 800 and then they're so excited they want to become a distributor. So that's kind of how it works. The oil industry is word of mouth. Yeah, I mean, from the value proposition, it takes them less time. Does it help? Um, because it normally, maybe the results wouldn't be as good, and it takes less time. Like, what are you, what are they seeing in the technology that's they've never seen before? So, uh, you know, on that one well that we were showing, let me talk about that. They were producing half a barrel a day, and we took them to over a barrel a day. All right, on the new ones, we're doing wells that are bigger, and we're getting the same kind of increase in results. We're expecting 200, 250, 300% improvement. So they pay a little, they spend a little bit of money with us as a service company, uh, or with our distributor as the service company. And they get this big increase in oil production. And so they're making more money out of their existing wells without yeah. having to do, you know, without having to, you know, again, do more drilling or use more chemicals or whatever it might be. Yeah. I mean, from the bottom line for them is it increases their output. It has so many other benefits, you know, to the environment and how it's, it's done, but they see an increased output in general. You know, the oil right? industry kind of looks at things that way. We want to do things on a sustainable way, and we're right. thrilled that we can be a green solution. Uh, but the oil industry says, just show me how to get more oil or how to clean up my my uh, water so I can meet the regulations. Yep. Um, I had a couple other questions, but anything else in here that you wanted to, to go over? Yeah. Uh, sure. Uh, I could share a little bit about how we make money. And when you're in three markets, each one has its own uh, its own um, uh, how how you make money. But just for one example, cleaning up that oil industry wastewater, a five thousand barrel per day saltwater disposal well, um, if we can rent our equipment for seven hundred thousand, that's 
maybe one fifth of the total uh, in and out cost of water. Uh, so they're saving money. Uh, but it costs us, our cost of goods sold might be only 91,000, giving us a gross margin of 87.5%. And it's that high because we own the equipment. It's kind of like a software as a service company, except we have real equipment to build. But the cool thing is that we could have a payback of about five months on our equipment with what we're making. So we make a lot of money. The customer makes a lot of money. Everybody's happy. And when we do that, we project that if we can get to just 338 5,000 barrel per day units in the field by the end of five years, we could be generating 200 million in revenue and over 100 million in EBITDA. And that's where we're headed. Now, the other question we ask all our entrepreneurs is, how does the investor make money? A lot of, they have a hard time with this because they don't know how all the investors work and how much how to project what the investor is really going to make. Uh, I use here for Nanogas Environmental the same thing we recommend for entrepreneurs, which is the venture capital model. So if an investor invests three and a half million dollars for 18 percent of our company, and we take in some more money later on. So after that, maybe they have 14%. If we had those earnings in five years of a, over 100 million a year, and we had, and we were able to earn just 10 times, we're able to sell the company for just 10 times earnings, you know, public companies sell for in the 20s, uh, we would be worth over a billion dollars in five years. And so then the investor could earn something like $150 million on their $3.5 million investment, that would be 44 times their investment or 113% internal rate of return. Now, unless you're in real estate or you're an investor, you might not know what internal rate of return is. It's really simple. It's just the interest rate that I would have to earn every year in order to get the same kind of results. So you might think, Okay, if I go have my passbook and my savings account, I might be earning one or two or maybe 3% now. Here we're saying that to get the same kind of return, not the same risk, mind you, but to get the same kind of return, uh, you would have to earn 113% on your interest-bearing account. So that's, that's why investors like investing in uh, startups because the return could be huge. They could also go out of business. We we know we're on track to be do very well, uh, and I've got everything in it because I don't think we're going out of business. But uh, investors have to take that into account. So then, you know, we would spend that on equipment, operations, sales, and marketing license. We've got patents behind this, and we've just been granted. You know, we've got eighteen granted patents, thirty more pending, and we've just got. Uh, Notice of allowance on a patent we're really excited about. It says we can stop anybody else from using nanobubbles in an oil well to recover oil in the U.S. So we're really excited about that. We think that's really valuable. And then there's other markets we can eventually get to. But when you're starting up, you have to focus. So we're, we're focused on just those. So we think it's great because we have a world-changing technology, a great management team. We've got great intellectual property. We already have revenue and we're making money. And uh, each of these markets that we talked about are $200 billion plus. Well, this is great. I love that the, this is so instructive because when you walk through the six questions and then you actually demonstrate it yourself, it's, it's great to see that. And this could be used for... For any company, even if you're not trying to sell or raise money, it's it's I feel like it's important just to have these questions answered. Yeah, we think so too. And we think especially companies selling, a lot of times, you know, entrepreneurs are cursed with knowledge. There's a book called Make It Stick that talks about that. The more we get to know about our business, the more detail we get into and the less understandable it becomes. And 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 so uh we think you need to make it simple. And when I build my presentations, sometimes I need to go to my partner on the coaching side, Lauren Minkus from Concept Equity Group, and say, Lauren, can you look this over? Because I'm in my own business, I'm cursed with knowledge, and I need to, 
you know, bring it up a level so that uh, it's easier to understand on the first go around. You know, we can get to the PhD level with the investors on the next meeting, but uh, we need to keep it really simple to start with. Love it. Well, Len, I have one last question. Uh, before I ask it, I just want to point people to check out nanogasenvironmental.com to learn more about what you're doing over there. Amazing stuff. And I'll, I know I love your focus on these specific industries. And uh, I had a guest on Dave Kalina who runs uh, a drink company. It's a O2. It's an oxygenated natural recovery drink. I was just at the CrossFit Games, and he was his company was everywhere. People are drinking it, um, and they add oxygen to help your body process toxins faster. And again, I'm not sure the science on that, but that's just what they talk about. So I'll have to tell him to watch this episode. So um, maybe there, you know, there's so many avenues you can take with this technology. It's pretty amazing. Well, have um, Dave give us a call because yeah. we've made the decision that if it's not one of those core markets, we're open to licensing. Yeah. And so what if he could put more oxygen in his beverage? Exactly. So I'm going to send this to him. Um, my last question, Len, is really, you know, you provide a lot of mentorship and um, to entrepreneurs. And I'm wondering who are some of the people that have been influential for you in your entrepreneurial career? Wow. Um, so, you know, I learn a lot from from everybody, but uh, we've got, you know, for Concept Equity Group, we've got a seminar on some of the amazing things, some of the things you should do in, in, in a pitch. And these apply to whether you're selling to a customer or whether you're selling to an investor, whatever it is. And so some of the things we like to we like to quote are uh, Simon Sinek. Simon Sinek uh, he has the uh, one of the top TED Talks on how, how great leaders inspire action. But really, his core question is starting with why. Why did you do this? And I think it's it's brilliant. I had to think about a lot about my personal why when I heard when I heard that talk. Uh, also, really influenced by. Uh, Steve Jobs and, and uh, Guy Kawasaki worked for Steve Jobs, de developed in the user interface for the Macintosh and how they approach presentations. And, and one of the things you can go out there and watch is Steve Jobs' presentation of the iPhone, for example. And you'll notice that there's very little text on his pitches and all the letters are really big. And, and uh, we think those are fabulous rules to go for in a pitch. And uh, and really, because uh, it, and so another thing I pay attention to is is Inc. Magazine. So I sometimes see really interesting articles on in there, and I caught an article that said science hates PowerPoint. And then I say, well, does it really say that? And no, it doesn't really say that. It really says. We can't read and listen at the same time. Humans can't read and listen at the same time. So why are we putting all this text on a presentation when the most important part of the pitch is the presenter? Great question. So those are some of the things we cover in our, se in our seminar. Those were influential for me. And then uh, one more person. Uh, who passed away, who was really inspirational for me. Jack Hayden used to run uh, an entrepreneurial think tank that I still participate in and uh, that meets every Saturday morning. And we we meet with an entrepreneur who's got challenges and we try to help provide insight and, and advice. And uh, Jack was there as the leader and really uh, created this group. And, and I, I loved it because I kept uh, picking up new insights every Saturday morning. Love it. Len, I want to be the first one to thank you. Thanks for sharing your story, your knowledge, and really the, the company that you work on is an inspiration. Check out nanogasenvironmental.com. Check out more episodes of inspiredinsider.com. Len, thanks so much. Jeremy, thank you. This was fabulous. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See, like I
like a peach if you find the sand right now. I'm feeling like a hundred grand.